It is now 3 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started um, so that I can honor your time and hopefully uh, we can get out just a tad bit early so that uh, folks can take care of the rest of their, their day and their weekend. How you doing over there? I know, I might have to leave. It's okay, I'm I, gonna I gotta tell you though, there, there's some prime seating right here, VIP seating. Okay. Well, because it's kind of hard to be... Okay. So, um, So how many uh, how many folks have heard a, pre a presentation that I've done uh, before, e even today? Okay. All right. So, uh, all right. Cool. Cool. Um, so just a little bit about me. My name is Andre Cohen. Uh, I'm a diversity trainer and consultant, and I work primarily with uh, government organizations and nonprofits. I do some kind of corporate stuff from time to time, but we don't speak the same language, corporate America and I, so sometimes we don't necessarily gel the way we could. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that are important. I taught high school and middle school for, uh, for eight years. Four of that uh, eight years was primarily uh, middle school, but I also taught some high school classes. I'm an uh, adjunct faculty member at uh, Bethel University and a faculty member at the Adler Graduate School in Richfield, Minnesota. Um, I have a master's in educational technology, so using computers to teach people how to do stuff, and my undergrad is in organizational leadership. And the most important thing you need to realize is that I used to be a teenager. And apparently I'm no longer one now. Right? When I work with, with teens, I, I used to, and I catch myself now saying, we. And they're looking at me like, what are you talking about? That's us, not we. Right? Um, so, uh, and, and it's very obvious, and I said this last time, it's very obvious that I have a presentation that I like to deliver, but just as important as what I'd like to deliver is a conversation that I'd like to have with you about what you expected to get out of this particular session. And so what, what are some hopes that you have um, as you walk out of this room saying, I'm, I'm glad that I attended this session because I got what I wanted. And so what is that? What, what are you looking for out of this particular session? So how do you help them find their own goals and not your goals? All right, cool. Uh, hopefully we will talk about that. That's part of my plan. All right. goal setting in limited situations, right? Because um, I also believe that limited situations also give us uh, better abilities to focus on on some goal accomplishment stuff. Other folks? Other things you were hoping we would talk about? I think ways to help you see the possibilities and beyond the barriers Okay, so to help you see beyond the barriers that they are, that they see in their families' lives, or that they may be experiencing themselves. Okay. And then over here, Andre. Yes. 
I work with teenagers who are deaf in a mentoring program, and they're all ninth graders. And she's African American, and also with her, I have a real struggle with what are your goals, what can happen in your life, and like, what are these goals for a young black girl in the cities? Where can she work? What are her options? I feel like I don't know. Well, we'll we'll try to identify that. Well, I did see a hand back here. Was it a, 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 a hand? Thumbs up, I agree. Oh, okay. thumbs up, you agree. All right, great, great, great. And also, kind of our, our practical goals about, like, you know, a lot of times I'll work with young people, like, I'm going to, you know, be a professional basketball player, football player, and that's great, but a very small percentage of people will make that. So, how can we, without dashing their dreams, work on maybe some more practical options if that doesn't fall through? Yeah. 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 Uh, I think rapper is another one, right? Mm-hmm. So kids will say, "I want to be a rapper." All right. Well, without dashing their dreams, and we can make this very realistic. How many poems have you written? How many poems have you read? If you want to be a rapper, how many have you read? If you want to be a professional athlete, <coughs> how many push-ups did you do today? How many are you planning to do tomorrow? Do you have six or seven hours just to shoot free throws? So when we start putting things in perspective for them, without dashing their hopes, because if they're willing to do the work, they certainly can achieve those goals. But unfortunately, we live in America where we're entitled to everything. I'm entitled to be rich, which is why I go on The Bachelor. Or bachelorette, whatever, whichever, same show, right? So, um, so yeah, so so that is a tool you can use to help them decide their goals. So before we get into it, to more conversation, I want to show a video, and I, I want to get your response to this video in terms of what might be, and, and we're going to pay particular attention to the young man. Um, he is the, the the protagonist in this uh, video clip. And I want you to, to explore. Now, we are guesstimating. We do not know for sure. But I want you to think about what might uh, this young person's attitude be and what kind of goal setting might he be engaging in based on his attitude. All right. So we're making lots of assumptions and presumptions, and that's good for this hypothetical situation that we're about to see. All right? So, if uh, my computer is working with me, this should come right up. Working with computers is like working with small animals or children. You have to be patient, and you never know if they're going to do what they're supposed to do. So we'll, we're pulling it up. So while we're waiting on that to, to kind of pull up or whatnot, how might you define an attitude, or how has an attitude been defined for you? What is an attitude? <coughs> it's the way you approach something. Okay, attitude. It's body language. Emotion. It's emotions. All right. What is an attitude? Response. A response. When adults talk about attitudes, what are adults typically talking about? I mean, my, my parents would say, boy, you have an attitude. You better do something about that. All right? So what, what are adults talking about when they talk about it? Okay, so the tone of voice. All right, what else? The word choice, body language, facial expressions, gestures, negativity. All right. um, and I, I want to say thank you for all of those. And in terms of attitudes, as I was growing up, my, my parents would describe themselves as being old school. 
That's how they would describe themselves. It looks like my video is coming up. So I, I'm going to stop there and work with my video. So I'll come back to that story in just a second.
Thoughts, comments, observations. Yes, ma'am. Stereotypes, judgments are still made. Okay. So there are a lot of things going on in that video. Stereotype, assuming, uh, prejudging. All right, other folks, other thoughts about? A good kid. A good kid. What do you mean? Who's wearing a hoodie? Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's a caretaker. Talented. Gifted, talented. Uh, yes. Okay. Now, I want to say this, that what we just witnessed was a piece of art. It was a fictional piece. How close to reality do you think that particular piece of art was? For me, it's that not everything, I mean, not everything was like, I mean, it is for real. I don't know how to say it, but like, it can be What else? Yes, ma'am. I think it's very much I mean, I just experienced it like three weeks ago. I just being like asked to go, like call them and ask if I was, if I wanted, just because my hands were in my pocket. And I just, I like my hands warm, but her, it, it seemed like I was trying to steal something. So it's really uncomfortable. And it's actually, I guess, an open rule of building. So. Wow. Yeah. Wow. All right. Other quotes? Is, was this, is this close to reality, or is this not very close to reality at all? I think there's definitely truth in it. Okay. In, in, you know, maybe not as characterized as that was, but it was also open. Okay. Uh, so high stress or low stress? <coughs> high stress. Um, for folks who... Uh, that this may be a reality for them. What is the long term? Um, effects of high stress situations like that. Because this was one, this was 30 seconds in one instance. And I would imagine that at least that ha might happen two more times in a day. Yes. Now, this is something interesting about young people, and I think you, you all know this because you probably went through the same phase that I did, right? Um, young people have an interesting way of creating logic for themselves because it's actually not logical, but it makes sense to them. And young people will typically say, well, if you think I'm doing it, then I may as well do it. Right? Anyone, as a, personally, have you had that rationalization for yourself? Right? You know, whatever. It could be any number of things. So if, if you think I'm doing it, I may as well do it. If I'm going to get in trouble for it anyway, I may as well have done it. I was just being honest. <laughs> right? Yeah. I was the, I was the crier. Because my parents did spank. Uh, so I was the crier because I know that's what they wanted. You know. So they, they get whatever tool they were going to use. And I'd be like, no, ah, I'm so sorry. Oh. But I had a brother who, you know, he was tough. And tough is not good when, when your parents are spanking. Because he's like, I can take it, I can take it. I was like, dude, I'm falling out. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I want you to think about in, in terms of his, his attitude. 
Now, is he more likely to engage the world in a positive way, or is he uh, just as likely to approach the world in a very hesitant way in, in terms of his interactions with the world, given that particular situation? What do you think? Yes, ma'am. Yep. So, so is it is it his perception of what other people are perceiving him as? And the the, the 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 key to that is perception is reality. So, if I think that other people are thinking this about me, then that's my re- that's the truth, right? So, um, th- th- sometimes we when we see particularly African American um, young men and now African men. Somali men um, and Liberian men who are being acculturated in this great place called America because other folks see them all as the same. Right? I, I don't know if... Uh, the, so I know that in, in Brooklyn Center um, High School, there's some friction between Africans and African Americans, between Liberians and Somalis and African Americans. Uh, and other folks are like, well, why don't you guys just all get along? You're all the same, right? And it's like, no. Right. But that's, a, that's another workshop. I, I do that on the side. Anyway, so, so one of the things that typically happens is that we have young men who are walking in a world that, is, that they think is already judging them, whether the, the, the world is judging them or not, whether it's true or not. They think that the, the world is judging them. And then every so often they get proven right. And so if they can't control anything outside of themselves, what do they say they, what do they figure out that they can control? If I can't control anything outside of me, what do I have control over? Over me. So, uh, so I will be intimidating. I will be boisterous. I will be loud. Because you don't hear me any other time when I'm trying to be civilized, but you don't hear me when I'm walking down the street, you know, Jay-Z and Bunch of Two and rapping and, and being all out because you don't see me any other time. And it's funny, and, 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 and teens in particular get really strange at crosswalks. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, right? So be, be it at a, be it a, a cross light or at a stop sign, you're sitting there in the car and... These people are walking so slow, right? And I live over north, and so one of the things that I also think is funny is I pay for the sidewalks. I pay taxes for the sidewalks. And they insist on walking in the middle of the street and get mad at me because I got bumpers on my car. But one of the things that they're saying is, I I don't have any power or control anything else, but I'm going to control this. And you can't make me walk on the sidewalk. You can't make me stop singing loud or or talking loud. And guess what my objective is? It's not to make them quiet. It is to make them be seen, but in a more productive way. All right? So so we're going to talk about that. Uh, I'm going to talk about the truths around human beings. Uh, this is, this is uh, a picture of me, and that's my brother William, and that's my sister Crystal. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but my, uh, my bow tie seems to be almost as big as my head. <laughs> and so I asked my mom about that. I said, Mom, why is my bow tie so big? And her first response was, well, son, that was the fashion. Right? But later I found out that, uh, that we were in, in such a state of poverty that we could not afford Easter clothes. But I'm not sure how we could afford the Olin Mills um, studio session. But, but at any rate, so my mother made our Easter, our Easter clothes. Anybody else have Olin Mills? Easter, yeah. Easter? Okay, cool. All right, so, uh, so, so that's our picture. So here's some truths about human beings. Uh, human beings can learn, change, and grow. Who I am today is not who I was at 17. 
Um, if you look at the, the front part of your, your handout, uh, that, that's a picture of, uh, of me and my friend, um, Samisha, and Sharon. And um, I know that looks scary that we're holding uh, uh, guns and, and that kind of stuff, but context is everything. So we were at a concert of a group that some of you may know um, by the name of Public Enemy. So we were at a public enemy concert, you know, fighting the power. That be, that's, that's part, one of the lyrics. Okay. Uh, um, and so who I was at 17 is not who I am today. And I'm glad that I have smoothed out. All right. um, and people do what they think works even when what? Even when it doesn't work. And why do people do things? that actually don't get them success, but they do it anyway. Why is that? Reaction. Reaction? What about reaction? reaction? Okay, so they get some kind of reaction. Yes? It could be the only power that they have. Attention. Attention. Has anyone seen a baby or a toddler fall out in one of those major department stores or in the grocery store? Right? I don't know about you, but when I see that happen, I make the assumption that this isn't their first time doing it. Right? And, and why do you think that babies, because they're not, that I never see the parent give them what they want. You know, I want fruit loops, I want fruit loops, ah! Right? The parent, never, I've never seen the parent say, okay, Johnny, here's some fruit loops. Right? Most parents are like, boy, if you don't get up off that ground, you know, they're just trying to recorrect, redirect the behavior in, in, in some kind of way. But, but the kid has done that before. Why? Because they got what they wanted. <coughs> Whatever that might be. At some point, that falling out thing got them some success. And so as human beings, we build on success. And so um, what we say is, if, if that behavior worked in the past, get all things considered, that behavior should work in the present, which also means that I will use that behavior when? In the future. So when will that, that baby, for example, change his or her behavior? When will their behavior change? But it's not working right now. So they're not getting Fruit Loops, but they keep doing it. Yes? They'll change when they, when they somehow figure out a different behavior that will get them what they want. Before they have to figure that out, they have to recognize that this behavior doesn't work. Because we know that the behavior doesn't work. The, the, the parents know that the behavior doesn't work. But who's failing to realize that? The child. And so the, the behavior will change when the child decides or figures out that that behavior is not working. They could be 35 before that happens, but at least it happens. Right? So, um, people do what they think works even when it doesn't. And all human behavior is goal-directed. Everybody does something to that they believe will help them accomplish their goal. I, uh, maybe I'm a pessimist or, or in my old age I'm getting, you know, uh, you know, grouchy or whatever, but I don't believe in true altruism. I think people do things because they get some kind of benefit out of it, even if it's just an emotional benefit, but people do stuff to, uh, to get something out of it. And last is that attitude is a reaction to a goal. You guys gave me great definitions for, for an attitude. But those definitions were inadequate for my parents. My, I told you earlier, my parents were old school, and they, they were raised by old school people. And so my, uh, my parents would say crazy stuff to, to, to try to get us to, to, to act right. Because my, my, my parents went to college, and they said, we have these fancy degrees, and so we're, we're going to raise you better than our parents raised us. So they tried to use psychology, they used sociology to help us change our behaviors. And when that didn't work, they went back to what they knew, which was yelling and screaming. <laughs> and so my father would say just crazy stuff. He'd say, boy, I don't like your attitude. You better fix your face. And so I'd go. 
right? And it gets, I get sent to my room. Or my mother would say, uh, you know, say crazy stuff because she just cut to the chase. And she'd say, boy, you better go to your room till you learn how to act. So I'd go in my room for a while. I'd get my act together. I opened up the hallway door and I would say, to be or not to be. I spent a lot of time in my room. But even as a late bloomer, I finally got it in terms of what they were talking about in terms of an attitude. You see, my dad was my pastor, so growing up, I was a preacher's kid. And on Sunday, we would go to church from 7.30 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. We stop at 3 o'clock for chicken, not because we're black, but because chicken is delicious. So all day Sunday is church. Friday night, I'd ask my dad for the car. Because my dad loves me, what does he say? He says, yes, he loves me. So I get the keys, I'm hanging out with my friends, I fill the car up with gas, I come home before curfew, and my dad says, I have what kind of an attitude? I have a good attitude. What do I say about my dad's attitude? He also has a good attitude. So Friday night, we're cool. Sunday, my best friend Dexter calls me at noon and says, Andre, can you pick me up for the movies? What do I know about Sunday? Church. All day. But I'm 17. I'm invincible. And Jesus is my friend. So I go to my dad and I say, Dad, can I borrow the car? What does my dad say? Not only does he say no, but he gives me a sermon about how I'm leading people to hell. (laughs) The worst consequence of my household was that you could go to hell. And you can either go to hell on your own, or my dad would show you the way. As a result of that, con- that, that conversation, what would I say about my dad's attitude? That he has a bad attitude. What would he then say about my attitude? That mine is even worse than his, right? So, so Friday night we're cool. Sunday we have a problem. What determines an attitude? The context? What you're looking for, the, the goal, you want, where you want to get and why? When you get what you want, you have a good attitude. When you deny access to what you want, you have a bad attitude. So when we have young people who are in front of us with a bad attitude, what do we know about them for sure? They're not getting what they want. They're not getting what they want. So there are two ways to help people have a good attitude. What's the easiest? Give them what they want. Now the interesting thing about about our young people, the young people that we work with, is that sometimes we can't give them what they want the way they want it. I mean, that's the wisdom of being an adult. And having access to power and, and all that kind of stuff, right? So, so I'm a classroom teacher, and I would always have this archetype in my class. And there's usually someone who sits in the back who is the, the uh, proverbial class clown trying to take attention from me. So they want attention. And in my early days of, of, of teaching, I would power struggle with those individuals. Because I'd say, you're not taking all the attention away from me. I have to get through this lesson. And they, they would say, well, I dare you to teach me. And then we get into this whole power struggle thing, the, the front of the class versus the back of the class. And now he, his influence is growing in the back of the class. So I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get my you know, Crimea group together and, 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 and annex part of the classroom as, as on my side. And, and so we're, we're having all of this confusion in the classroom until I got wise. What I realize is, as the teacher, I don't need to power struggle with the kid. Because I have all the power. Master of the universe. Teachers always win. They know how to play the rules. But what is winning if I'm losing all of these battles? If my students don't want to come to my class, they don't want to learn, what, what, what is winning doing 
for our long-term relationship. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to give that kid what he wants. So he wants attention, I'm going to give him attention. And so I said, Jeffrey, um, I'm going to need for you to pass out these papers. Can you pass these papers out for me, Jeff? Yeah. Oh, cool, man. All right, good. No, no, Mr. Cohen, Mr. Cohen, you got to have boundaries, right? And so, uh, so I invite Jeff to start passing out papers. And then I say, well, Jeff, I need you to write the, the, the notes up on the board. So you uh, hear my notes, if you can write those up on the board. And, um, and if you can take attendance tomorrow, that would be great too. And so all of a sudden, I, I'm taking Jeff out of the back of the class, bringing him to the front of the class. And then I say, you know, Jeff, you know, you're doing all this stuff for me, man. Um, why don't we just make you a special desk right next to mine? So all of a sudden, I've taken this, this, um, this deficit in my class and made it an asset for me. And so not only is, is Jeff the, you know, writing the board and taking leadership, he's getting the attention that he was looking for, just not the way he was asking for it. And so when we talk about, you know, we have kids who are in confined areas and they have limited um, choices, I think that's the best thing for them, to have limited choices because they can be more clear about the choices that are available to them. One of the things as adults that we typically do that's wrong, and it's just wrong, is that we give kids too many choices. Or we give them choices that don't make sense. I'll never forget, my, uh, my, my sister is, uh, my niece is now 18, but when she was four, my, uh, I was over and my sister was in a power struggle with my niece. And she was like, you're going to eat these peas. And the baby's like, mm-hmm. She's like, yes, you're going to eat these peas. And the baby's like, no, no, no. And so, so I came over, and, um, and, and I'm talking, I'm watching this stuff. And I was like, I was like Chris, just chill out, right? So what, what's the big deal about these peas? And she was like, well, she's got to eat her, you know, learn to eat her vegetables and blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, that's cool. So, so we, we, I let that chill out for a while, and, and um, I brought the baby back to the table. And I said, look, you can have seven peas. Or you can have five peas. Guess what the baby did? She ate five peas. Five more than she would have fighting with, with her mom, right? And so we have to start giving our, our kids realistic, small choices that help them build their encouragement and their, their uh, esteem so they can start having faith in their ability to make big choices. Right? And so uh, we, give, we, give, we give folks choices. We give, we give students choices. This can be d- done on Thursday or Friday. I need this assignment on Thursday or Friday. You decide. It's going to get done, but you get to decide when. Right? And so we typically don't give young people uh, lots of choices. And so um, an attitude is a reaction to a goal. And so when we see a bad attitude, we know that a kid or, or a person that we're working with is not getting what they want. The second part of that is that what if what they want is not attainable? They don't have the skills or the abilities to get it. Um, I don't have the right to give it to them. And if I could, they couldn't manage it anyway. Then what becomes our, our job as a helper in helping them? To have a good attitude. How do we help them have a good attitude when they can't get what they want? Help them to see what the possibilities are and more importantly, what? Because I can see the possibilities. I can see clearly now. Right? So not only help them find a new goal, but help them actualize what that goal is. And, and, you know, too often our policies and procedures want to tell kids what to do. And what happens when we tell kids or we give them advice about what to do as opposed to them developing it themselves? They shut us out. And their success and their failure, because we gave them the idea, is external as opposed to it being internal. So we're not helping them to develop on the inside. We're helping them to become more compliant. The last thing we need in this world is more people who are compliant. We need thinkers. We need movers. We need shakers. All right? So let's go to your handout.
So in terms of good attitudes versus bad attitudes. Um, so growing up in my household, there were certain things that I knew were against our policies. It's not how we did things. And one of the things that my parents would, would, would say is, um, you don't talk back. So that was a rule. So they gave you a direction. They gave you some, you know, some advice. And you did not talk back. And so one day, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling myself, right? And so my dad says, Andre, uh, or I'm full of my own britches. I'm full of my br- you know, big in my br- How does that go? Something about britches. I'm getting too big for my britches, right? So, so, I, uh, so my dad says, Andre, take out the trash. Now, I know the family rule, which is what? Don't talk back. So I say to this man, why do I have to take out the trash? What happens? Silence. And then he repeats it. Boy, I said take out the trash. We got all these other kids. I took it out last week. I'm out to the other. And now my, my dad is engaging me and we're starting to talk about what? Are we talking about the trash? No, we're talking about me. Talk about, boy, you don't talk back to me. What?